Hey, if you've got a Bible there this morning, can you turn with me, please, to uh, Matthew chapter 3? Turn to Matthew chapter 3 with me. If you've got it on your phone, then pull up your phone or whatever it is that people have these days. You notice that less and less people carry one of these with them now because the ease of access on computers and tablets and jazz. I, I, I still like having pages in my hands. Maybe I'm a bit old-fashioned like that. There's something about turning a physical page that, that, that st- stimulates me and doesn't hurt my eyes as much as the little screens. But um, hey, I want to share an experience, something that happened to me um, a couple of weeks ago, actually. Does anyone, was anyone involved in the great um, diesel disaster of 21 in Ganelaba, Lismore? Anyone get caught up in the great diesel disaster a couple of weeks ago? A school bus, a school bus, that's what, that, is that what happened to your foot? No. no. Okay. We all know what happened to your foot. Um, <coughs> he's in kids' church, we can talk about him. A um, couple of weeks ago, there was a diesel spill here in Lismore. So apparently what happened was a school bus, is the story I was told, that a school bus filled with diesel either had a leaking petrol tank or forgot to put the cap on, something like that. Anyway, uh, this guy went on his route and from wherever he fueled up, and he, I know, what I do know is he went down Holland Street, he turned right at the roundabout, and then he went down uh, Pineapple Road towards Summerland, and then he must have come back up and then he's headed out of, of Lismore sort of towards Ballina there. And I remember waking in the morning and my daughter got uh, uh, ready for school and I was taking her to school and we jumped in the car. And when we got to Holland Street uh, to turn onto Holland, we smelt fuel. And we thought it must have been the car in front of us, but obviously it turns out it wasn't. We turned onto the road and I just could see all over the road the rainbow colours that you get when there's petrol on the ground. <laughs> and so I'm driving very carefully as I, I, I drive like Miss Daisy anyway, even on a good day, but um, I'm driving really carefully and we get up at the top to the roundabout hole and we turn right to take my daughter down to Summerlin to school there and there's petrol all over the road and as we're heading towards the Pineapple Road roundabout, I notice there's about five or six cars, they're already pulled over on the side of the road, they're just lined up there. And so I turn down to the school, I get to the school and we pull up and my daughter gets out of the car and we notice this smell and then we thought, oh, I wonder if it's my car, is there something wrong with my car? But we got out and had a look and I could see the fuel all up and down the road and it was obvious that there'd been a, a major spill. So anyway, I turned around, I came back up to the Pineapple Road roundabout there, turned back down the Road to the roundabout at Chemist Warehouse. When I went to turn left to come down Holland, my car actually spun out and I lost total control of it. And I was only in first gear, I wasn't going fast, and the car just skidded right across and almost hit a pole in the traffic island there, and I I just managed to get control of it. And so I got control, and I pulled straight over on the side of the road. And when I pulled over, I got out of my car, there were two cars already there, and they both had had a crash. So they're there with their cameras out, and they're filming the petrol on the road for the insurance company, and they're telling me about, you know, we're trying to make sure we get our insurance claims and all that stuff through. And while they're talking to me, I notice another car comes around the roundabout and loses control, and another one loses control, another one. So I thought, here's what I'll do, being the good Samaritan I am. I'm going to go and walk up to the corner there, and I'm going to ring the fire brigade and let them know there's been a spill. And I'm going to stand on the corner, and I'm going to do this, and this is my way of saying to all the cars, slow down. down." Exactly, you get it. Now, it's not a hard message, is it? It's a simple message. But it's amazing how many people miss the message. I'm standing there and I'm doing this while I'm on the phone to the fire brigade, right? And there was three different groups of people. First group of people were possibly some of you. They were Christians that I knew. I knew them from from, um, different church things and and, and things I've been a part of and so on. And they would drive past. And here I am doing this. Now, what do you think I'm saying? Right. I'm saying slow down. I'm trying to help you. And they're driving past and they look at me and I don't know what they're thinking, but they got a big smile and went, hey, and started waving at me like I just had nothing better to do than be a good Samaritan. And that was my Christian witness. Hey, Jesus loves you. I don't know what they're thinking. They're waving at me and I'm watching them go past. They hit the curve and lose control. I'm I'm trying to help you, but you're not getting the message. It's getting missed somewhere in translation. And the other group of people drove past me. Now, they were people that I'm assuming and hoping aren't frequenting Christian events and churches because they were giving me a different set of hand signals. And it didn't take me long to realise they weren't getting my message either. It was also getting lost in translation. So they would give me their hand signals, hit the roundabout and spin, lose control. Hey, I'm just trying to help you. (laughs) And then, of course, there were the ones that were intuitive enough to understand what I was saying. I would do this, they would slow down, and as they slowed down, I would point to the road in front, they would see the fuel, thumbs up, thank you so much 
for helping us. I had a very clear message that I wanted to give them, but it's amazing how sometimes a message that can be so simple and clear can actually get lost in translation somewhere along the way for various and different reasons. I want to talk this morning about a message that I think has been lost somewhere in translation. Yet it's so incredibly pivotal and key and fundamental and basic to our journey and our walk with God. It's this word called repentance. Anyone ever heard that word in these ancient documents? It's mentioned a few times by a few different people. Matthew chapter 3 Jesus, uh, sorry, uh, the, Matthew writes this about John the Baptist. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent. Saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This, meaning John the Baptist, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years earlier. And Isaiah said this, that John the Baptist would be a voice of one calling in the wilderness. And then he says this, John's message will be this, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So hundreds of years before John the Baptist comes, Isaiah speaks into the future. We call it in church world, he prophesied. He spoke of something that was going to happen down the track and he got it right. He said, when this guy comes, this will be his message. His message is going to be, let me put my glasses back on so I don't mess it up. When he comes, his message will be this, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So hundreds of years earlier, this man's going to come, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. When John the Baptist gets here, the one that as I was speaking of, John stands up and his message is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist's word repent, his message repent, was interpreted by Isaiah to mean this, make straight paths for God. Make straight paths for God. So what exactly is this message that John the Baptist brought about repentance? In a nutshell, here's what it is. It's about making a straight path between yourself and God. I live about 850 metres from here in a straight line. If I could go directly straight from my place to here, apparently it's 850 metres. But I can't get from here to my house in 850 metres. And you know why I can't do that? Because there are these things called roads. And instead of a road that goes straight from where I am now, straight through those buildings, over that little creek and straight to my front door, instead what I've got to do is take a road that takes me away from where I'm trying to go, because that's where the road goes, because there's buildings and trees and bushes and obstructions and all kinds of things that are standing in a straight line between my house and this building. So I can't go in a straight line from my house to this building. I have to go in a kind of roundabout way that's much more complex and complicated and not as straightforward. But if I could go straight, it would be 850 metres, but the journey's longer because of all these obstructions in the way. When John the Baptist is saying repent and Isaiah hundreds of years earlier is saying that when John comes, his message will be declare the way of God, make a straight path for him. When I put those two things together, I get a bit of a picture of why it's so important for me to grasp this, this, this word, this understanding, this concept of repentance. Because repentance is about removing those obstacles and things that are in my life so that I can have a straight path to God. Things that are in my life that are standing between me and him. Things that are stopping me from becoming all that he wants me to be. Things that are stopping me from doing all the things that he put me here on this earth to do. Things that are ultimately stopping me having the most straightforward and clear access to God so that I can experience God in my life right here, right now, the way that he intends for me to experience relationship and life with him. See, I think a lot of people don't experience relationship with God the way God wants it because we have all these obstacles and things in between the path from us to Him. And so when it comes to God, there are so much complexity and there are different ways that we try to go and things that take us away from Him and things that block us. When, when, when the Word of God says that we should be able to just come boldly 
before the throne of God's grace. Repentance is about getting a hold of those things that are those obstacles so that we can clear them and we can make a straight path from me to God and also a straight path from God to me. Amen? Repentance is a good thing. I think for so long, repentance has had this negative connotation. Like a lot of other things in Christianity, death to self has a negative connotation. But that's only because we're focusing on what we're losing, not what we're getting. We might have to die to a few things in our own life, my own desires, my own plans, my own purposes, once I realize that God's got a plan and a purpose. But if I focus on what I'm losing and what I'm missing out on, yeah, it seems like a tough deal. But if I stop looking at what I'm missing out on and start looking at what is it that he wants to exchange for that, what does he want to give me, I realize I'm coming out on top. And repentance can be a little bit the same. What am I giving up? What do I have to stop doing? What do I have to let go of? If we focus on it that way, it can have a really negative connotation. But what God wants is when we deal with those things and we come to a place of what the Bible calls repentance, what it's giving us is a straight access directly to God. Who doesn't want that in their life this morning? Who doesn't want to have that to know that when you come before God, you can come boldly to that throne because there's nothing there. There's nothing standing between you and Him because you've made that path straight through this gift, this, this great opportunity that we have to repent. We don't even need to have that opportunity. God could have said, I'm not even going to give you the chance to do it. You've blown it. Deal with it. This is your lot in life. But God gives us this amazing opportunity to be able to look at those things that are in the way, that that path is crooked and we've got to go around. He says, I don't want you going around them. I want you to remove them so we can just go straight through them. Isn't that a great thing this morning? God didn't have to give us that opportunity, but he has given us that opportunity. And I want to talk a little bit this morning about repentance. Deal Moody, many, many years ago, Deal Moody said this, and those of you who don't know, he was an American evangelist in the 1800s. D.L. Moody said this. He said, The world has yet to see what God can do with a person fully consecrated to him. The world has yet to see what God can do with a person fully consecrated to him. I love that thought. A person whose heart is fully for God. A person who has done whatever needs to be done, made the adjustments, repented so that all those obstacles are removed so you've got that clear, straight access to God and God to you to become who I'm meant to be, to uninhibitedly run into the things that he wants me to run into. He says, the world is yet to see that person. But I love the second part of what he said. He said, by God's help, I aim to be that man. Who in this room would love to be that man, that woman, that person who is fully consecrated to God, who's not standing here with one foot over here and one foot over here, but a person who can stand boldly and confidently before God and know, Lord, if there's anything in that way that's not making that path straight, you speak to me, we'll deal with it because I want what you want for me. I want, I'm having what she's having. Remember that movie many, many years ago? I want what God wants for me. And repentance is the way that we straighten out that path and that we get that straight line to God and God to us. I want to just, again, have a look at how important this message is. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This was Jesus' message. Jesus came and his message included this little thing, misunderstood thing called repentance. The disciples carried that message on. Mark chapter 6, verse 12, it says, They went out and preached that people should repent. So the message continued. John the Baptist brought it. Isaiah said, this is what's going to happen. This is going to be the way back in the relationship with God. John the Baptist picks it up, runs with it. Jesus preaches it. The disciples preached it. Acts 2.38, Peter, the first message that he preached to see the birthing of this movement we call the church. Peter says this to the crowd, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's that word repent again. Acts chapter 20, we get a glimpse into Paul's message. Paul preaches this. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's very clear biblically that we cannot be restored back into relationship with God if we don't do this thing called repentance. In Luke 13, 3, 
Jesus says this. He says, I tell you, unless you repent, you too will all perish. Unless you repent, you will perish. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Repentance is the first word of the good news that we call the gospel, the story of Christ. It's impossible to be restored back to relationship with God and feel like we can bypass repentance we can't i think it was was um william booth actually william booth said this uh the founder of the salvation army many years ago i love who likes william booth i I think he was an amazing man here's one of his his quotes that he said once he said the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the holy spirit christianity without christ forgiveness without repentance salvation without regeneration Politics without God and heaven without hell. Forgiveness without repentance. There can be no forgiveness, according to the writers of these ancient documents, without repentance. And I wonder how many believers are running on five cylinders, not all six. Because we've skipped this most foundational part of our faith. Primarily because we don't really understand what it is. The writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, says that repentance is one of the fundamental foundational doctrines of the Christian faith. It says, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ. Then he lists the elementary teachings. He says, Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. One of the very first foundational doctrines, according to the writer of Hebrews, is this issue of repentance. So we know how important repentance is, but what exactly is repentance? Well, before we look at what repentance is, I just want to give you three things that repentance is not. And then I want to give you a picture of what repentance is. Number one, repentance is not a prayer, though it may include prayer. Repentance is not a prayer, but it can include prayer prayer how many of you have met people who went along to a meeting and prayed a prayer of repentance maybe somebody led them in that and said this is it. i remember when, when I, I i wasn't even a believer but my cousin got interested in god when we were about 16 and he took me along to this christian meeting and we went to the meeting it was a great meeting it was at austinville um somewhere there anyway now at the end of it the guy got up and he gave a message and said uh, come on down the front and you know you can receive jesus my cousin he grabbed me by the arm he said if i'm going you're going and i was like well, whatever so he dragged me up there we go down the front and of course he's really been touched by God uh, I was only touched by him on the hand that's why I went up there and so I'm standing there with him and they 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 they, 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 they took us out the back and this guy uh, says you know here's the prayer you got to pray and so he tells us what to say to God and I'm not against this I, I get what they're doing I'm not bagging but I'm just saying if somebody's got to tell me this is what you're doing I'm not quite sure or I've got clarity on what I'm actually doing um, and so he leads us in this prayer of repentance Well, isn't it interesting? My cousin prayed that prayer of repentance. To this day, he's not walking with the Lord. Um, And I don't know how many other people I've seen over the years that have come forward at an altar call or gone to a meeting. And I'm sure without a doubt, every person in this room can think of one person who prayed a prayer of repentance, but it did nothing in terms of transforming or changing their life. You see, repentance is not a prayer that we pray. It can include prayer, but repentance is not a prayer. I prayed the prayer, but my life is still the same as it was before. Why? Because praying a prayer is not repentance. It can be part of it, but that's not what repentance is. Number two, the second thing, repentance is not an emotion, though it may include your emotions. Repentance is not an emotion, though it may include your emotions. Who's ever been there? I'll paint you a picture. Daniel on the guitar. Perfect pitch voices sound like an angelic choir up on the stage the tears are flowing the guy's up there sharing the story thinking of the he's got that one story that he does everywhere he goes that tugs at the heartstrings and pulls at you and people get all emotional again repentance is not an emotion but it can include emotions i'm not bagging emotions 
But they just keep on going. I've been in meetings where they get up and they will give you the gospel message and say, who wants to come to Christ? And nobody responds. So then stage two of that, if no one's going to put their hand up because they actually logically want to, then I'm going to try to draw your emotions out. And so now I'm going to tell a story. And I've been there where people have gone, I'm going to, you know, five seconds, put your hand up. And then 10 minutes later, they're still going, almost begging somebody. And they're using all the emotional trickery they can just to get you to cry and get you to a weak emotional moment. So you come forward, give your life to Christ. Who's ever seen people do that only to walk away in two, three weeks' time? They're the same person. Nothing's different. Their life's not transformed and it didn't change. There's nothing wrong with emotion, but repentance is not an emotion that you feel. You can repent and have no feelings about it whatsoever. That's the truth. And thirdly, repentance is not an apology, although it may include apologies. Repentance is not an apology. How many people feel that repentance is going to God and apologizing for doing something wrong? Every time I do something wrong, I have to go to God and I have to grovel or beg or whatever it is, but, but, but repentance for me is simply offering God an apology. Now, part of the problem with that is how many people in this room, I don't want you to put your hands up, how many of you have gone and offered God that apology only to turn around and go and do the same thing again? And the problem compounds, doesn't it? Because God, I've apologized for this. I've offered you my apology. And then I go out there and a couple of days later, I do the same thing again. So now I come back and I'm going to offer you another apology. Now, the last apology didn't change me, so I'm feeling a little bit guilty about that because the previous apology didn't actually transform my life or change my heart. Also feeling a bit like a hypocrite because past experience tells me, God, I'm going to apologize to you, but I'm going to be back here in the same place in a couple of days anyway because that's just history tells me that. That last time I apologized, I went out and did it again. So now I'm feeling a little bit like a hypocrite. So I'm standing here apologizing again, dealing with the guilt and the condemnation of knowing I did this last week and nothing changed. But now I know based on history, I'll probably go and do it again the same time while I'm standing here apologizing. Repentance is not an apology, but so many people feel like repentance is an apology. I can go out there, do whatever I want, but every time I fail, as long as I come and apologize to God, I'm sweet. Is that all repentance is? Just, just coming back to God every time you let him down? Or every time you miss the mark? Sin is a, 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 a Greek word that basically lent, meant miss the mark. So it was an archery term back in the day, and there would be an a, a archer thing there. The target was there, and a guy would be up here, and he would pull back his arrow, and he would release the arrow, and the arrow would fly through the air. And if it fell short of the target, the poor guy that had to stand up there near the target, um, he had to stand up there, and if the, if the arrow fell short, he would call out, Sin! You missed the mark! And they would adjust their shots. It was an archery term, meaning miss the mark. So every time we miss the mark, is that what we do? Is that what repentance is? Miss the mark, go and apologize to God, only to go back out there and miss the same mark again and just keep the cycle going of apologizing to God. It's amazing how many people feel like that's what repentance is. It's just as long as I, as long as I come back to God and say sorry, the rest of it doesn't matter. I've said sorry, I'm sweet. I think repentance is meant to be something more than just that. So if repentance is not a prayer, it's not an emotion, it's not an apology, and what exactly is repentance? Well, biblically, here's what repentance is. The Greek word for repent means to change one's mind. It means to change your mind. You're thinking a certain way about life. You're thinking a certain way about certain aspects of life. You're thinking certain things are okay. But God's saying those things are not okay. You need to change your mind about how you're seeing that and start to bring your mind into alignment with the way that God sees things. You need to change your mind about that habitual sin that you keep going back to. You need to change your mind. You need to change the way that you view the world. You need to bring your mind into alignment with the mind of God and start seeing things the way that God sees things. Now, you can do that by enacting your will. You don't have to have emotions involved. It's not an apology. It's, it's looking at the world and looking at my life and going, God, I'm going to come into agreement with how you see these things in my world. And by an act of my own free will, I'm going to make a choice to agree with you and to turn around. So he, he, he's one of the problems with, 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 with repentance for a lot of people. We feel like this is a picture of repentance. I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to play with sin. Not that you're sin, son, but I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to play with sin. Right? I'm just going to play with with sin and then I'm going to feel guilty about it so I'm going to apologize and here's what I'm going to do I'm just going to turn around like this 
but I'm going to stay close enough because I know I'm eventually going to want to play with him again. <laughs> so, God, I'm sorry. Oh, back around. Oh, sorry, God. Sorry, God. Sorry, God. Ooh, back into it. Oh, sorry, God. Sorry, God. Anyone feel like that in their life? You get in these cycles. You know what repentance is? Repentance is. God, you say this is not good for me. God, you say this is not an appropriate use of the life that you gave to me. So I'm going to come into agreement with you about this, God. And what I'm going to do is turn, and because I've changed my mind about it, I'm going to actually walk away from it. I'm actually going to turn, and I'm going to walk away from it. Not just turn and stand there, so it's easy to go back to. I'm going to turn around, and because I've changed my mind about that, I no longer want to be standing right next to that anymore. I want to get as far away from that as I can because God says that's not an appropriate use of this gift of life that is given to me. So I'm going to turn away from that and I'm going to start walking in this direction. That means if I've truly repented, if I take three steps away and I want to go back to that, now it's a little bit more difficult because I've changed my mind. I've changed the way I see that. So to go back is a very deliberate action not just a habit or repetition. Now it becomes deliberate when I go back and start playing with that thing again because I've not only turned, I've started walking away from that thing. See, repentance is an act of your will, but your will gets engaged by changing your mind, coming into alignment and agreement with what God says about certain things in your world. I know that the world says certain things about cheating on your taxes, but I think God doesn't want me to cheat on my taxes. So even though... I can justify till the cows come home that it's okay to cheat on my taxes. I've also got a conviction that I shouldn't be cheating on my taxes, so I need to change my mind and start doing the right thing. Young people, the world says it's okay to sleep around and have multiple partners, right? That's what the world tells you. It's okay. What's, what's bad that can happen? I just want to say to you, God says, you know, there's a reason why I don't want you doing that. And it's not to take the fun out of your life. It's because I actually love you and I want the best for you. And so I'm going to say to you, even though culture says it's okay, I'm going to say to you, it's, probably, it's not a great idea. Don't do it. I didn't create you and bless you with life so that you could spend it doing that. So I want you to turn from that stuff and I want you to change your mind about it. Agree with what I'm saying, not what culture is saying, not what, what the rest of the world is saying. I want you to come and bring your mind into alignment and agree with what I'm saying about that particular area of life. You see, our world doesn't change until we change the way we think. That's why repentance is so powerful. Your actions in your life are progressing and moving towards your strongest thoughts. So the things that you think about life, are that if you were to sit down here and take all the thoughts out of your head and lay them on a table, most people could look at those thoughts and tell you where your life's going to go. Because your strongest thoughts and the way you think about things gives you a, a context for what's acceptable and what's not and where you will go and where you won't. That's why repentance is so powerful. It's not an emotion... It's not an apology. It's about coming into alignment. Why do you think it's the very first thing of the gospel? You look how many times in, in, the, in the gospel messages and in the letters and in the book of Acts, the word repent and the word faith are put together. It says repent of your life and turn towards God. What's it saying? Because repentance is an action that we do. It's something that we do by changing our mind and the way that we think about things, and then we turn away. See, initially, when I st before I followed God, I thought a certain way about life, and those thoughts took me down a certain path. 19 years of age, I came to a place where I had to agree with God because the place that my life was taking me wasn't, wasn't good. It was acceptable in, the, in society, and it probably looked great to a lot of people out there, but on the inside of me, I came to a place where I had to make a decision. I'm either going to turn away from that and start following God and agree with God, that prayer is good, reading the Bible is good, getting around other believers is a good thing, stop getting smashed on the weekend, stop doing this, stop doing that. I'm just going to have to come into agreement with God and turn around and go. And there was a lot of times where I didn't feel like it. My feelings wanted me to go back and keep doing stuff. But repentance is not an emotion or a feeling. It's a choice. It's a changing of our mind. And so I had to change my mind and sometimes battle against my own uh, fleshly desires that wanted to go back into that stuff. But I had repented. I changed my mind about it and gone well I'm not going back to that I'm heading in this direction and I'm going to start walking and a new life opened up for me because I made that decision to line myself up with God 
That's why repentance is the first word of the gospel. You can't say that you have faith in God, but you're going to keep thinking like the world. I can't say I've got faith in God, but I'm going to keep thinking, I'm going to keep my mind filled with what society says is acceptable, the direction society says my life should go. If I'm really going to follow God, the first thing I've got to do before I follow, I've got to change my mind. I've got to change my mind first and go, you know what, I'm going to start turn my life around and I'm going to head in the direction of God. And then when I turn and head in the direction of God, that's why repentance comes and then faith. And then all of a sudden I'm facing a different direction. Now my faith has power to it because I'm actually moving with God, not saying I've got faith but moving against God. Does that make sense? I say I've got faith but I'm moving against God. And we wonder why we don't get breakthroughs. We wonder why we can't break the power of that sin. We wonder why we feel powerless and helpless. We wonder why we're in this cyclic avenue because we're still facing here saying, I've got faith in God, but my mind's still saying this is all okay. When we do a 180 and we turn and we change our mind and we start facing God, that's when the power of the Holy Spirit becomes real to us. That's when we begin to walk out of those things because we've made our mind up that we want to walk out of them because that's what God wants. That's what God wants. So many people apologize uh, for, for, for sin, maybe because they're caught. And they're not really turning and making their mind up to turn and go with God and agree with God. They're just really upset that they've been exposed or somebody else knows about it. And so I'm all apologetic to God, and I'll call it repentance, but I haven't made my mind up to turn. It's just that I've been busted and there's certain consequences I'd like to escape. But you can still want to escape those things, but you still haven't made your mind up that you're going to go with God. You haven't changed your mind yet. And so you find yourself in a cycle over and over and over and over again. You see, repentance starts by making a decision. It's an act of your will to start agreeing with God when it comes to the issues and affairs of your life. Repentance is a change of thinking that produces a change of direction that produces a change of action. Let me give you a very simple example. I'm on this thing called the man shake at the moment. Yes, one whoop from the front. Now, I know some of you are amazed. You're looking at me going, he doesn't need to be on that. But if you had have seen me about 12 months ago, I had an ever-expanding tummy. Just, just, the rest of me looked fantastic. Just this part here. It's just getting out of control. And so you know what happened? One day I stood in front of a mirror. And I looked at myself in a mirror and I looked and I went, what's going on there? Where did this come from? I bind you, devil. Satan, in Jesus' name, come out. It wasn't that. It was me. You see, I had this, this, this thing uh, called a passion for bacon and cheese zinger burgers. Anyone like bacon and cheese zinger burgers? I think they're the greatest hamburgers in the history of the hamburger kingdom. A bacon and cheese zinger burger is the greatest burger on the planet, and I would devour bacon and cheese zinger burgers and then stand in the mirror and wonder, why am I an ever expanding human? I just couldn't get enough of them. Any chance I'd get, I'd sneak out for a bacon and cheese zinger burger. It was, it was, it was, I felt like some kind of addict. I hid it from my family. They didn't even know the struggle I was going through, but it was real. And I would eat these bacon and cheese zinger burgers. Anyway, one day I looked in the mirror and I realized, you know what? These bacon and cheese zinger burgers are not good for me. I think they're good, but I know they're not. Anyone anyone know what I'm talking about? I think it's good, but I know it's not in my heart. It's a bit like that with sin, isn't it? I think it's good. I mean, if, if sin didn't feel good, we wouldn't do it. Amen? We wouldn't be doing that stuff if we didn't feel like there was something good in it, whether it was a feeling or whatever. But, but I, there's a lot of things I think are good, but I know they're not. And so I'm looking in the mirror and I have this moment where I realize, you know what, I'm putting on weight. So here's what I did. I had to change my mind about the bacon and cheese zinger burger. I had to change my mind about the bacon and cheese zinger burger. Instead of thinking this was a good thing for me, I had to come into agreement with my natural body and go, you know what, this is not a good thing for me. And then I had to make a decision. And that decision was I turned around and I started walking away from that. No longer did I deliberately find a reason to drive past KFC so I could get a smell of the burgers cooking and then be by compulsion dragged into the drive-thru. And I just started avoiding. I would go around the KFC so I didn't even have to see the sign anymore, which made it so much harder for that KFC to get its hooks back in me and keep me in that place. I changed my mind. And instead of looking at KFC, I started looking at apples. I started looking at man shakes. started looking at dried fruit and nuts. And then once I changed the direction that I was looking in, then I changed my action. I wasn't just looking at man shakes. I started having it. Not just looking at apples and nuts. I started eating them. 
And then the end result of changing my thinking and changing my direction, what I was looking at, and then changing my actions is this fantastic body that you see standing before you right now. You see, it started with a change of mind. It started with a change of mind, and that's what repentance is. Repentance is within the grasp of every person in this room right now. Right now. I don't have to wait for tomorrow. I don't have to wait till my feelings come into alignment. I don't have to wait for, for, to, to, to get some apologies out. No, no, no. I can make a decision and a choice to repent right now and to change my mind and agree with God and turn and start walking in another direction. It doesn't mean I won't be tempted, but what it means is I put myself in a position where God can get involved because I'm clearing the way for a straight path to God. I'm clearing the way for a straight path to God so that I can begin to walk. I mean, we all know what the Bible talks about. We've got this victory and we're that and we're that. Yet it's not the experience of most believers anymore, is it? We know we're ahead and not the tail, we're above, not beneath, and so on. And I wonder for many of us, have we missed this foundational concept of repentance? We still haven't changed our mind completely and gone, no, I'm going to walk in the direction that God says. I'm going to agree with what God says about these areas and aspects of my life. And when I come into agreement, it's amazing how the power of the Holy Spirit gets involved. And that's when real breakthrough starts happening. And that's when change and transformation starts happening in our lives. But we have to make the choice. We have to make the choice. We have to make the choice. Look at that. Ruth is now going to have to repent of watching another church online while she was here. Yes, I'm sure it was, Ruth. I'm sure it was. Associate pastors, can you believe that? What hope have we got? Even our associates don't listen to us. We'll talk later. <laughs> you want to come back up, Daniel? Get the music guys back up. I want to finish up here. The end result of repentance is not that God and others hear things from me. It's that God and others see things in me. Repentance is not something that you hear from someone. It's something that you see in them. You can see a repentant person. You can see the transformation and you can see the change in their life. Paul the Apostle preaching Acts 26 verse 20. He says this, speaking of his ministry, and his preaching, he says, First to those in Damascus I came, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. That's you and me. He says, I preached that they should repent and turn to God. There's that concept again. We're repenting. We're turning from something. We're changing our mind. We're no longer facing here. We're turning from something. And what are we turning to? We're turning to God. He says, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. John the Baptist put it this way when the Pharisees came to him. He said, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. See, when we repent, there's transformation and change. Most of us know about Martin Luther, the reformer, and the 95 points that he nailed to the church door at Wittenberg. What most of us don't know is the contents of those, that thesis. His very first point said this. He said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he called for the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. He called for the entire life Repentance is not, I made a mistake, I've got to repent. I made a mistake, I've got to Repentance is turning your entire life around to God. Repentance is deciding that what God says trumps what I think. What God says trumps what society says. What God says trumps what my church says, my family says. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. But repentance is a life we live, not an action we do every time we make a mistake. Your sins are already forgiven. Did you know that? They don't suddenly get forgiven when you say, God, forgive me. Jesus did something 2,000 years ago, so incredibly powerful. But your sins were dealt with, dealt with. Our response is not to keep making mistakes and apologize. Our response to that is to repent, turn our life around and make a decision that we will come into alignment with God with the entirety 
of our life. Now, I believe there are probably people here this morning and you've got areas of your world and you know you struggle with and you just keep struggling and you keep struggling. I wonder whether you, you, you do what I was talking about here. You just, you, you're not really repenting, you're just apologizing. You can repent today. It doesn't mean that you'll never slip up again. That's not what it means. But what it means is you've changed your mind, you've come into agreement with God and you've given yourself the best chance and God the best chance to get involved in that and to empower you to walk away from that so that you can be free. So that you can be free of that. Here's what I want to do this morning. I want to ask you some questions. Are you ready to agree with God concerning your life? Are we ready to agree with God concerning sin? Those areas where we just know we're going around the mountain. Are we ready to walk a path of repentance, not apologize to God, not sit in a service and go, God, I'm sorry. But are we ready to change our mind? Repentance doesn't begin with a prayer now. Repentance begins with your first step when you leave. Repentance begins when that temptation tugs at your heart and you have to make a choice. Do I bow to it and run with it? Or no, I've repented. I, 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 this temptation, see, temptation tells me it's good, but the Word of God tells me it's bad. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe God. Are you ready to give God a straight path to your life? Ready to lay aside the sin and the weights and the things that hold us back to remove the obstacles and to enter into the relationship that Jesus died to give us access to? I'm not going to ask us to come forward and pray. Maybe, maybe this morning you might feel like you, you want to pray with somebody. Hey, we encourage people here to pray with one another. You can come out the front and we've got leaders here. We can pray for you, pray with you. Um, but hey, you can, you can turn to the person that brought you and ask them, would you pray for me? That's just as powerful. We're talking to the same God. But what I want us to do is I've asked Daniel to play a song. It's an old song and we all know it. I have decided to follow Jesus. Who knows that song? You know, I believe that is the greatest song of repentance that the church has ever heard. Because that's what repentance is. I've changed this and I've decided. I've decided I'm not going to live that way anymore. I've made the decision I'm going to turn. And I believe this with all my heart when we make that decision, that the power of heaven is unleashed on your world. And you start finding ways out of the temptations. You start finding open doors. You start finding things falling off. But it comes back to decision. Can we stand to our feet this morning? Here's what I want to do. I just want us to sing this song through a couple of times. And I want you to think about what you're singing. What you're really singing is, I've repented. I've repented. I've changed my mind. And I'm going with God. It's between you and the Lord this morning. And then I'm going to pray for us. And then there's tea and coffee next door. And you can go and go to town on your tea and coffee unless you're repenting of coffee. I don't know what God's saying to people. I know what he's saying to me. That's what matters. That's where I have authority and control. Feel free to grab a tea and coffee. Can we just respect the space here? If people want to hang around and pray, chat, talk, whatever, that's fine too. But let's just sing this through a couple of times, then we can head off. Thank you, Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back I have decided To follow Jesus I have decided To follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus No turning back No turning back The cross before me The world behind me The cross before me The world behind me The cross before me the world behind me 
the cross before me the world behind me no turning back no turning back I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus No turning back No turning back Let's just sing it once more I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus No turning back no turning back No turning back No turning back Thank you, God. Well, Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. I, I just want to pray right now, Holy Spirit, you know the hearts of every person in this room. And God, you know where we're at. And uh, Father, if there are people here and they're, they're struggling in their faith, God, they're not sure then Holy Spirit, I pray, would you meet them? Would you reveal your son, Jesus? God, would you reveal your son to those people in this room? And Father, for those this morning that are doing business with you, God, that have, Lord, repented, God, we've made that decision. We're going to change our mind. We're going to agree with you, Lord. I just pray for all the power of heaven be unleashed upon those people, God. Give them a fantastic week. Lord, let them begin to bear fruits of repentance. Let them begin to see the fruits of repentance. Let those around them begin to see the transformation and the change that true repentance brings into our lives, Father. And God, I pray as we leave this place in the next seven days, would you give everybody in this room the opportunity to tell somebody out there, God, there are so many people that don't know how good you are. God, so many people out there that think you're angry at them, that you're mad at them, that you hate them. God, give us a chance to tell them about your grace, your love, your mercy. God, give us a chance to tell someone this week, someone who doesn't know who you are. Give us the opportunity to tell them that you're real and that you died for them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Hey, I'm going to get these guys to keep on playing. And if you want a tea and coffee, help yourself. Uh, best tea and coffee you're going to have in the next 10 minutes will be in that room next door. It's a scientific fact. You can't argue with science. Um, other than that, guys, we'll catch you during the week. <laughs>